Hey everybody, it's Scott, your boy, uh, aka Saru, uh, back with another episode of the Sengoku series. Uh, this is the first of my Tokugawa Ieyasu videos. Uh, it's been a while, it's been a minute since my last video. Um, you know, obviously with the July 4th holiday and me still plugging away at my dissertation and just trying to have a life, uh, I haven't had a lot of time and plus I've been doing a lot of prep work um, for the Ieyasu series. I've been reading my Sadler, uh, getting ready for this, these videos. Uh, and basically how I'm going to do it is uh, this first video will be about his early life. Uh, he was born in 1543, so from that point up until about 1575 in the Battle of Nagashino. Um, and then I'll pick up uh, in the second video with the death of Nobunaga in 1582. Uh, I'll cover the 1580s uh, and the 1590s, so till Hideyoshi's death in 1598. And then the last and final video, I'll talk about uh, 1600, the Battle of Sekigahara, and uh, the defeat of the last sort of remnants of resistance to uh, Tokugawa rule with the battles of, uh, or rather the sieges of Osaka Castle, and then uh, up until uh, Ieyasu's death in 1616. Um, so first I just want to talk first about his personality and then a little bit about his physical characteristics um, before I actually get into the biography part. Uh, personality wise, uh, I guess if anything, he, he obviously was a patient, um, cunning, uh, somewhat cynical man, a bit of an opportunist, I would say. Um, you know, it's often said that, or it's rather emphasized in Japanese culture that Ieyasu was um, a very you know patient man, a wait and see kind of strategist. Uh, there's a couple of adages. You know, one uh, is that Nobunaga. Uh, well, the, the th three unifiers when they're trying to make a bird sing, Nobunaga would threaten the bird to make it sing. Uh, Hideyoshi would charm the bird or try to entice the bird to make it sing, whereas Ieyasu would just wait for the bird to sing on its own from its own volition. Um, and another adage goes that uh, Nobunaga prepared the, the rice ball or something like that. Um, Hideyoshi cooked it and then uh, Ieyasu ate it. Um, again, meaning that, you know, these other guys sort of built, uh, these other guys being Nobunaga and Hideyoshi, sort of laid the foundations or the ground or groundwork for, for unification. But Ieyasu sort of had the resolve or the willpower or the, just the patience to wait and actually create a lasting foundation. What's, it's more accurate to say that he was kind of lucky. He was lucky in the sense that he, I don't want to say he jumped on the coattails of Nobunaga, but he kind of did. I mean, he just happened to be in the right place at the right time, um, as we'll talk about in this video. Um, and then he was able to sort of hold on to his, you know, independent power base um, and really take advantage of the downfalls of certain lords, especially the Takeda. Uh, and then he was in a really, and the Hojo, and then he was in a very good place to launch a bid for power when a power vacuum happened to open up in 1598 uh, because Hideyoshi didn't leave a very strong and stable you know, base for continued 2020 rule, which led to Ayasu making a play for power in 1600 and again, he was very lucky that the Toyotomi loyalists didn't really have a very charismatic figure to rally around, you know. His main, the leader of the opposition was Ishida Mitsunari, who was widely despised uh, across Japan. And there were a lot of uh, lords in Japan who rallied to Ieyasu, mostly out of their hatred for Mitsunari. Um, so you know he's kind of, you know honestly he is the least favorite of mine among the three unifiers. Um, I do think that he, because he is the winner, so to speak, and because as the saying goes, winners write history. Uh, he's often portrayed in a very positive light. Um, you know, as this sort of heroic figure who's surrounded by all these loyal retainers who he loves like family, and you know they they believe so much in his vision for the future that they. You know, are willing to die and go to these great lengths for him. Um, but in reality, um, he was an opportunist. I mean, he wasn't better or worse than any of his contemporaries. You know, he was not, you know, exceptionally bad or good. 
Sengoku warlord, but he was, you know, he certainly wasn't a hero, uh, you know, to the extent that any of these people can really be described as heroes. You know, he was a human being just like the rest of us. Um, physically, um, you know, a big thing is made about how he was a bit of a chubby guy. He was a chubby warlord. Um, you know, in most depictions, even in, you know, video games and so on, he is portrayed as being rather stocky. Um, there are a lot of stories from history that he was too fat to ride his horse, uh, that he suffered from, you know, hemorrhoids and was un unable to, to ride a horse. Um, I think I think it's agreed upon that by the time of the sieges of Osaka, you know, he was too fat to, to actually, you know, do much participation in battle. Um, but on the other hand, like there are a lot of reports, again, you know, you know, pretty biased reports, not reliable sources, I would say. Um, but he was a very active participant in, in a lot of the early battles, at least in his life, uh, such as Anagawa and his battles against the Ikoiki in, in Mikawa province. Um, so it's probably fair to say that the truth is a little bit in the middle somewhere, that he was certainly a very stocky, heavy person. <laughs> um, but, you know, he, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that he was unable to fight in battles or that he was not, you know, he was physically disabled, like he was so obese that he couldn't, you know, walk around and, you know, wear a suit of armor. Um, but, you know, you had to take some of these, you know, oh, he was so heroic and led his troops in the front line. I mean, you have to take some of that with a grain of salt because, you know, just generally speaking, most generals do not lead from the front. Um, they typically hang back and let, you know, regular ordinary, you know, Joe Schmoes like me um, fight in the front line and die for their greater glory and honor and so forth. Um, so, again, now delving into the, the biography part of this, uh, Ieyasu was born in 1543 uh, to Hiro, Hiro, Hirotada uh, uh, Matsudaira uh, Hirotada. And the Matsudara clan, or at least that from which Ieyasu, the young Ieyasu, sprung, uh, is in uh, Makawa province. So here we, there's a map of Japan from uh, Taiko, the book about Hideyoshi uh, by E.G. Yoshikawa. And uh, here's Owari, which is where, uh, if you know your Oda Nobunaga uh, business, it is, that's where uh, the Oda clan is based. Here's Makawa. And then over here you have uh, Totomi and Suruga provinces, which are under the control of the uh, Im uh, Imagawa clan. So our good friend Imagawa Yoshimoto uh, is based there. Um, but in 1543, uh, uh, the Mikawa, or Mikawa province and the Matsudaira who rule it are really stuck between a rock and a hard place, or specifically they're caught between the Imagawa clan uh, to their east and the Oda clan to their west. Um, they're kind of like Poland in a sense in that they're caught between these much larger powers and uh, the Matsudaira are sort of divided between whether they want to accept being vassals of the Oda clan or vassals of Imagawa. And so uh, Ieyasu's father, Hirotada, uh, is actually uh, in favor of uh, submitting to the Imagawa or at least, you know, allying with them as sort of the lesser of two evils, like, you know, he doesn't want to get with the other clan. Um, and I should mention that uh, Ieyasu has many names in his life, and we're going to cover them all in this video. Uh, he's born as uh, Takachiyo, so he's Matsudaira Takachiyo, uh, and I believe Takachiyo is like a hereditary children's name, you know, it was typical for samurai to have many names in their life. You know, when they're children, they're minors, before they come of age, they have this uh, a name that's only used in that period. And for uh, sons born into the Matsudaira clan, or at least older sons, uh, the name was Takachiyo, which I believe Sadler says means uh, a thousand years like a piece of bamboo, which I guess bamboo is very, is known for its long period of life or something. Um, but. Anyway, so he's born Matsudaira Takachiyo. 
Um, so in 1548, uh, the Oda clan, which is headed by uh, Oda Nobunaga's father, Nobuhide at this point, uh, invades uh, Makawa province. Um, Hirotada, uh, Matsudara Hirotada, goes to the Imagawa, who is ruled, which is ruled by Yoshimoto at this point, and asks for help, assistance basically, uh, to save them from the invading Oda clan. And Yoshimoto says, sure, I'll help you guys out, but in exchange, I want a hostage. Uh, in fact, I want your son, uh, Takachio, to come and be my hostage. And this is a very common practice in this period of feudal Japan. Uh, you know, it's common throughout history in many different cultures where, uh, you know, to sort of ensure your loyalty, uh, a vassal will send to his lord um, a hostage, you know, a family member, or multiple family members. And in fact, uh, when the Tokugawa shogun is established you know, much later, um, sort of this whole hostage thing becomes a matter of, of state policy that you know, the Tokugawa shogun resides in Edo, modern day Tokyo, and all the, the vassals will keep their wives and children in the capital uh, where you know, the shogun can reach them. And, uh, these vassal lords will alternate their time between staying in Edo uh, with their wives and children and being back home in their uh, own domains, wherever they may be throughout Japan. So, you know, basically they can't stay in their domain with their families. Um, their families are hostages of the shogunate. So anyway, back to 1548. Uh, Hirotada agrees, and he sends his son uh, Takachio um, to Sunpu, which is the capital of the Imagawa uh, clan. Uh, but before Takachio can arrive, he's intercepted by Oda Nobuhide, who captures him and takes him as uh, his own hostage. Uh, so now uh, the young Ieyasu uh, Takachio is in the hands of the Yoda clan. And Oda Nobuhide tells uh, Matsuda Matsudaira Hirotada, look, I have your son. Um, if, unless you surrender to me and you know, break off ties with the Imagawa, I'm gonna kill him. And Hirotada replies, allegedly, that, you know, go ahead and do it. You know, even if you kill my son, I'm still, you know, we're still done for, you're gonna conquer us. And at least if you kill my son, uh, Imagawa Yoshimoto will know, uh, you know, that I put my allegiance to him before, you know, your threats to me and my family. Uh, and that just shows what a, you know, nice vassal I am. And, you know, allegedly, uh, Nobuhide was so impressed by this, you know, putting uh, the interests of the clan before his family, which again is very common sort of Japanese sentiment, or at least sort of it's a virtue uh, in, in feudal Japanese culture. Um, that he spares uh, the young Ieyasu Takachiyo. Um, so, um, you know, for whatever reason, whether that's true or not, uh, Nobuhide does not kill uh, Takachiyo. He spares him and he resides there as a, as a hostage. Um, so in 1549, um, this time, uh, no, uh, Yoshimoto Imagawa, or Imagawa Yoshimoto rather, uh, sends forces uh, into to against the Oda, and they're besieging Anju, Enjo Fort, uh, Fortress. And um, by this time, uh, Hirotada Matsudaira Hirotada is dead. Uh, he's killed by uh, vassals underneath him who are loyal to the Oda. Um, Oda Nobuhide also dies, however. He's killed by a plague, uh, an epidemic uh, that sweeps through Awari. Uh, so now the family is sort of, the Oda clan is in this state of disarray. Uh, you know, Nobunaga is sort of the one that will rise above his, his rivals uh, and take control of the clan, but at, you know, in 1549, this is still very uh, up in the air. Um, so Nobunaga releases uh, uh, Takachiyo as a hostage in order uh, to prevent the Imagawa from taking uh, Anju Castle. And uh, so that's sort of how uh, 
Takachiyo Iyasu uh, returns into the, the hands of the Imagawa clan. Uh, so he's not a hostage very long uh, with the Yoda, and sometimes it's made out in fiction that Nobunaga and Ieyasu, uh, who later on become, you know, very long-running allies, you know, must have been friends and played and become, you know, really, you know, best bud, BFFs back in this period. But again, there's no, you know, evidence to suggest that, um, that that's historically accurate. You know, how much, to what degree, if any at all, that they um, sort of commingled and, like, knew each other well, I mean, they must, you know, they were probably acquaintances, no doubt, um, but, in any, you know, friendship, uh, it's doubtful, especially based on what we know about their relationship later on. Um, but I think what's more telling about this time period is, you know, the death of his father, Ieyasu's father, Matsudaira Hirotada, in uh, 1548, uh, you know, being killed by vassals uh, who were ostensibly loyal to him, but who were, you know, defected to the Yoda clan uh, and murdered him. And, you know, what an impression that must have made, you know, and how counter it is to this idea of honor and, you know, loyalty to your lord and, you know, what we think of, you know, we're like in samurai in popular culture. You know, how much that must have in, been ingrained within what a lie, what a, you know, bunch of, you know, BS that is in the minds of the young Ieyasu. Um, you know, for his father to be killed by vassals and what, you know, that, what that really exposed, you know, certainly it was, you know, not uncommon in the Sengoku period, you know, the time of warring states, time of chaos and, stri chaos and strife and war. Um, but, you know, obviously I think that must have really kind of made Ieyasu, you know, very cynical about this idea. Of, of honor and loyalty and so on. And, that, and I think it really characterizes a lot of the decisions that he made that were a little bit, you know, underhanded or exploitative and so on. You know, it, you know, really said, you know, you must be an opportunist, you must kill or be killed, you must do what you must to get ahead in this world because all these concepts of loyalty and honor and so forth is just a bunch of, you know, rhetoric. There's nothing really behind it. Um, so, you know, that's something I think to keep in mind, you know, there's a lot more, I think, to be read into that than there is about, you know, Nobunaga and uh, Ieyasu being buddies uh, when, during this sort of hostage period. Um, so, Ieyasu becomes a hostage of uh, uh, the Imagawa finally, as he was meant to be, and he's basically... Uh, used by the Imigawa, by Imigawa Yoshimoto, um, as a pawn in his schemes. Um, you know, as we know, the Imigawa clan uh, has its eyes on marching westward, westward expansion. Uh, you know, whether or not the overall goal of that was to march on Kyoto, the capital, and, you know, establish a new shogunate and so on. Um, you, know, you know, whether that's true or not, uh, you know, we don't really know for sure. Um, but definitely, you know, Imagawa Yoshimoto was planning to, you know, secure this triple alliance with the Hojo to his, uh, to his east, uh, the Takara to his north, and, you know, free up his forces to move westward. So using Mikawa as a springboard to march into Awari, wipe out the Hojo and, and move, or the Oda clan, rather, and, you know, continue moving in that direction. So the Mikawa, Mikawa and, you know, the Matsudaira clan and those who were loyal to it, the retainers, were merely, you know, cannon fodder to sort of spare Imagawa uh, Yoshimoto and his retainers from, you know, a lot of the dirty work of, you know, having to fight and die in these battles. Um, so a lot of sort of these skirmishes that we see with the Oda up until 1560 and the decisive battle of Okahazama are being fought by uh, the men of Mikawa. And, you know, we often hear a lot about, oh, these, you know, were crack troops, you know, really a tough, you know, the men of Macaw were just so, you know, you wouldn't want to go up against them. And I think there is truth to that just because they were so battle-hardened, you know, being used as frontline fodder by the Imagawa. Um, they definitely, you know, by the time they were able to, you know, enjoy a degree of independence after 1560 uh, and fight and alongside um, the Oda, the you know, Oda Nobunaga's forces, um, you know, they had a lot of experience, so they definitely were not, you know, green troops, 
Um, they were definitely really you know, well versed in, in war. Okay, so this is where we get into the to the name changes. So in 1556, um, I believe Ias, Iyasu comes of age, he's around 13 or 14 years old, and he uh, takes the name uh, Motonobu. And the Moto in his name comes from uh, Yoshimoto himself. Uh, Yoshimoto was uh, his hat father, his hi Iboshiya, um, which, you know, is a concept I don't really understand. You know, basically, I just kind of his adoptive dad in a way. Uh, so Yoshimoto passes on uh, the character of, of Moto to uh, uh, Iyasu, who's gone from Takachiyo to Motonobu. And then shortly thereafter, Iyasu changes his name from Motonobu to Motoyasu after his grandfather, Kiyoyasu, who had, uh, you know, been the head of the Matsudaira clan. Uh, so now in 1556, uh, he's now Matsuyara, Matsudaira, <laughs> Matsudaya, Daira, Matsudaya, I'm not even sure I'm saying that right. Anyway, he's Motoyasu now. Um, <clears throat> so he's not Ieyasu yet, but I'm going to keep referring to him as Ieyasu just for the sake of clarity, hopefully. <laughs> um, so 1560 rolls around, um, as I've established, uh, Imagawa Yoshimoto makes his alliances with the Hojo clan, the, Taka the Takada, he's ready to move west into Owari through Mikawa. So he sends Ieyasu uh, to reduce a fortress in a wari belonging to the Yoda at Marune. Um, he's, uh, Ieyasu is successful in doing so, and his troops rest. So he's not actually involved in the Battle of Okahazama. He misses that out completely. If he had been there, I'm sure he probably would have been killed, along with all the other Imagawa you know, forces and you know, Yoshimoto himself. Um, so obviously, as we know, it's a huge victory for the Yoda clan, for Oda Nobunaga. Um, and, you know, instantly there's this push from within the Matsudaira clan to declare independence, to, you know, break free of the yoke of the Imigawa clan and chart their own future. Um, so very covertly, sort of under the radar, uh, Ieyasu uh, makes an alliance with the Yoda clan, with Oda Nobunaga. Um, Behind the, behind the back of uh, Yoshimoto's successor, Imagawa uh, Yujizane, uh, who is, you know, really derided throughout history as not being a very capable man, uh, more interested in the arts and poetry, and I guess, you know, too effeminate to be a warrior and all this, you know, typical stuff, macho stuff um, that you'd expect. Uh, so Ieyasu kind of makes it out like, hey, I'm just, I'm making friends with Oda Nobunaga because I want to protect my, uh, you know, our position in the West, uh, but I'm still loyal to you. Meanwhile, he's telling Oda Nobunaga, yeah, that Imagawa Yujizane is a loser, I'm with you now. So again, you know, Ieyasu is, is playing the, the opportunist um, and seeing, you know, the writing on the wall, so to speak. Uh, so in 1561, uh, he makes his play against the Imagawa to sort of officially, you know, make mark his breakup with the Imagawa clan. Um, the problem was that his wife and children, or child, uh, his son, were with uh, the Imagawa clan as hostages still. Um, so uh, Ieyasu attacks a castle, uh, Kamenojo, um, and uh, kills the commander who's... Uh, man it belongs to the family of uh, Yudono um, I don't remember his, his first name sorry but he takes his kids and uh, uses them basically as hostages to get his wife and child back from the Imagawa uh, so again some more you know hostage negotiation and that that's sort of when the alliance with the Oda becomes official uh, so uh, in 1564 uh, Ieyasu uh, decides to move against the Ikoiki in his province, in Makawa province. And if you watched my video where I talk about the Ikoiki, I, you know, I kind of go into greater detail there, but uh, in short, they are a religious sect throughout Japan. Um, you know, they've managed to take over Kaga province, but they're found everywhere. And they're basically, uh, you know, farmers, people of the rural population, 
uh, including everyone from sort of poor samurai who live in the countryside to uh, you know peasants who work the land who are you know sharing common this adherence to uh, uh, the pure true pure land set uh, which is a you know a very specific branch of, of Buddhism um, that is sort of very anti samurai anti warrior class uh, and uh, you know, is sort of using the, the chaos created by the Sengoku period to sort of assert their their autonomy, if you will. Uh, so, you know, Ieyasu ain't having that, like any, you know, self-respecting warlord. Uh, so he goes against them and wins, and this is where you sort of get the reputation of him leading from the front. He's almost killed in a decisive battle against uh, the Makawa Manto, as they're called. Um, but he, uh, he wins out and just sort of as an aside uh, from this uh, conflict, to sort of prove just like how widespread and commonplace, you know, the following of this true pure land sect was, uh, one of his main vassals, uh, Honda Masanobu, was loyal, uh, you know, sided with the true pure land sect believers against uh, Ieyasu. Um, and sort of, you know, how this pitted lordship and the idea of, you know, being loyal to your lord versus being loyal to your faith and what you believe in. And uh, I believe Ieyasu pardoned Masanobu after the fact, after the conflict was over. Um, and so interesting little anecdote is that part of the deal with the sort of the, the religious leaders who, you know, led the true Pure Land sect in Medkawa is that the temples would be left alone to as they originally were. So sort of a, you know like a white piece with these you know these religious temples aligned with the true pure land sect, but after you know peace was established, Ieyasu had these temples tore down to the ground, and when you know the monks protested, it looked like you know we had a deal here, you know they were going to be left as they originally were. Ieyasu was like, well, by originally were you know, before they were temples, there was just you know you know empty ground here. So technically, when I said as you know, as they originally were, what I meant was like, you know, as you know, empty, raised, you know, patches of ground. So again, you know, poking holes in the whole idea of honorable, uh, you know, samurai who you know never break their word and are loyal to a fault, blah blah blah. It's all BS. And pretty funny in a way. You know, not funny for the monks, but uh, say la vie. The monks weren't so innocent either. Um, so after he's established everything, you know, he's kind of consolidated his rule in Mikawa. Uh, well, first in 1566, he changes his name for the last time. So he's gone from Takashio, the kid, to your boy, uh, Mononobu, later Motoyasu. And then finally in 1566, he becomes Tokugawa Ieyasu. So the story about why Tokugawa... Tokugawa what had been a cadet branch of the Minamoto family, the Minamoto clan, which if you know anything about the rise of the samurai class or the establishment of the first shogunate, the Minamoto were, you know, the OGs, like the real, the founders of the first, you know, the shogunate system were, you know, a military dictatorship, which is the true de facto power, you know, leaving the emperor of Japan to be just kind of a ceremonial figurehead uh, office position. And it was very common to claim descent from the Minamoto or, you know, one of these noble clans, the Minamoto or the Fujiwara or the Taira clans. And, of course, there's absolutely no evidence to prove that Ieyasu was actually descended from the Minamoto. Just like, you know, a lot of these connections were spurious that we, you know, that, that we hear about in the Sengoku Jedi. Um, but, you know, everyone, every warlord wanted to say, hey, my pedigree is better than everyone else's, you know, I'm closer to this, these noble families. You know, were they positioning themselves to be like the next shogun? You know, probably not, not in this, at this point. Um, no one could see that far in the future. And, you know, at this point, Ieyasu is a junior partner to Oda Nobunaga, who, you know, while he's won a big victory over Imagawa Yoshimoto against, you know, insurmountable odds, he's still not the shogun. He's not, there is, you know, everyone, for all intents and purposes, like the next show, the, the, the rightful claimant to the shogunate is Ashikawa, Ashikaga Yoshiaki, who was, you know, kind of just a guy before Oda Nobunaga, you know, 
off, you know, invites him to to work with him to make him the shogun, and he does become the shogun. You know, Oda Nobunaga doesn't take the position for himself, even though he, you know, the Oda, claimed descent from um, either the Minamoto or the Taira. I forget which one it is, but it's one of those, you know, prestigious clans. <laughs> anyway, so that's where Tokugawa comes from. It's just it's it sort of reinforces this claim by Ieyasu that he's descended from the Minamoto. And so the Ie in Ieyasu comes from uh, a very famous figure belonging to the Minamoto clan, Minamoto Yoshi-Ie, who's sort of like the paragon of what every true samurai should be. Uh, if you've heard of Hachiman, the god of war in uh, Japanese culture, uh, he is Yoshi-Ie deified. Like he is the the you know the end all be all the the goal that every samurai wants to be he's like you know if lancelot is the model for chivalry in you know for western knights you know minamoto yoshie is like the you know the model the paragon of virtue for every samurai so that's where ea comes from so ea yasu so he keeps the yasu in honor of his grandfather kia yasu he drops the moto which he got from Imagawa Yoshimoto, because he dead, he's no longer important. Um, and he takes Ie from Minamoto Yoshie. So finally, he's Ieyasu. Um, so in 1570, he's got Makawa under his control. Um, you know, he's he's allied with Oda Nobunaga. He decides to move west. Uh, no, I'm sorry, he moves east. Um, you know, he's got, he's got uh, the Oda clan to his west. Oda Nobunaga is going north against uh, the Saito clan, against his father-in-law's family. Um, so Ieyasu uses this opportunity to move eastward against the Imagawa, who are now fragmented under the weak leadership of Yujizane. And so he's going to expand into his most immediate uh, eastern province, which is Totomi. Uh, so he strikes a deal with uh, the Takara, Takara Shengen, uh, who's you know to the north of the Imagawa domain? So Imagawa, or I'm sorry, Takara Shingen is going to move south and take uh, uh, Suruga Province, uh, which is to the immediate uh, east of Totomi, and Totomi is going to go to the Tokugawa. And sure enough, this happens. But again, to show you know what an underhanded rascal, what a scoundrel Ieyasu is. Uh, he takes in Yujizane. He's like, hey, you know, even though I just took all your, you know, part, half of your clan's lands and divided it up with Takeda Shingen, I'm actually your buddy. I kind of like you. I feel bad about how this all turned out with Yoshimoto and stuff, but, you know, that, them's the breaks. But, hey, you know, someday I'll, I'll, I'll help you out and maybe, you know, help you get Saruga province back um, from, from uh, Takeda, Takeda Shingen. So, you know, there's all this stuff, like, in Sadler talks about, like, oh, you know, he's such a good, dutiful servant, like he really hated having to go against, you know, the Imagawa and everything, which is, about, again, much a bull. He just does it because Yujizane has a claim on Suruga province, so when the pact with Takeda Shingen eventually breaks down, uh, he can make a claim, you know, on, uh, on Suruga, just as, for example, Oda Nobunaga used uh, Ashikaga Yoshiaki's claim on uh, the shogunate to, you know, basically become the power behind the throne of the whole, uh, of the shogunate, uh, such as it was in this time, at this time. Um, so, but I'm getting kind of ahead of myself here. Uh, so he takes Totomi, he expands his province, there's a temporary peace with uh, the Takeda, like a, a little bit of a pact, not necessarily an alliance, because he's really only allied with Oda Nobunaga, and so in 1570, uh, just as uh, he's taken over Totomi, in June of 1570, uh, Oda Nobunaga moves against the Asakura. Um, and as we know, the Azai clan, uh, headed by Azai Nagamasa, who's married to Oda Nobunaga's sister Oichi, uh, betrays Nobunaga, sides with the Asakura against the Oda, and uh, Ieyasu is called upon to fight uh, alongside the Oda at the Battle of Anagawa, um, which is a decisive battle uh, against the Asakura Azai coalition. 
Uh, and the way it's set up is that originally uh, the, uh, the Tokugawa forces were supposed to go against the Azai, but kind of at the last minute, um, Nobunaga decided that his beef with Nagamasa is personal, like, you know, he's betrayed me, I have to take him on myself, um, that the Tokugawa forces are, are asked to take on the Asakura. And it's fought in a very, the shallow waters of a river, the Aragawa is a river, Gawa means river in Japanese. And uh, this is where Ieyasu and his forces uh, really uh, make a name, you know, keep making a name for themselves, really. And there's a passage from Sadler um, after the Oda Togawa uh, alliance wins out over the Asai Asakura coalition. Uh, Nobunaga showed his gratitude to Ieyasu after the victory, which was mainly won by his assistants, by presenting him with a sword by Nagamitsu, a famous uh, swordsmith, which was formerly an heirloom of the shogun Yoshiteru, who's a uh, who is the show, who is the Ashikaga shogun preceding Yoshiaki, known known as the swordsman shogun because he was very gifted with, uh, or at least was very proficient with swordsmanship. And uh, Nobunaga also gave Iyasu an arrowhead that had belonged to Minamoto Tama, uh, Tamatomo. So again, you know, making that uh, Minamoto connection, as well as describing him as one whose merit this day is beyond description for it has no equal till now and is unlikely to be excelled in future, who is the sheet anchor of our house and the great builder of the portal of martial valor. So that's uh, Nobunaga talking up uh, Ieyasu. Um, but really, you know, again, they weren't really friends, BFFs. Uh, you know, this is kind of a common trend where, you know, one, one guy, you know, they're both kind of expanding in opposite directions. Um, but when one needs the forces of the other, you know, the other calls upon the other to sort of back them up. Um, but really, you know, outside of that, you know, they don't share an overarching goal. You know, it's not like Ieyasu is going along to make Oda Nobunaga, Oda Nobunaga the most powerful man in the country. You know, because Oda Nobunaga had marched on Kyoto, you know, marches on Kyoto, makes Ashikage Yoshioki, Yoshiaki the new shogun, you know, that's kind of the way it is. But all along, you know, Ieyasu is always, you know, he's still looking out for himself, basically, and trying to, to, to you know, expand his power. Uh, and that brings us to his showdown with uh, the Takeda. Um, in 1572, uh, there's the Battle of uh, Makaragahara, uh, where uh, Takada Shingen comes down. Um, he allegedly, the story goes, you know, walk, uh, goes past uh, the Toyotomi, or I'm sorry, the Tokugawa uh, headquarters base in uh, Hamamatsu, I believe, in Totomi. And uh, Tokugawa Ieyasu was so irate. Oh, how dare he just walk, you know, past me and turn his back to me? How dare he move, you know, westward without confronting me first? I'm going to go out and, and challenge him. And of course, you know, this was a bait to lure Ieyasu out. Ieyasu takes it, he's defeated decisively, he's forced to retreat and run for his life. Uh, he retreats to a castle, uh, and the story, I want to emphasize story, goes that he, instead of, you know, hold, you know holding himself up in this castle uh, and you know, taking defensive fortifications and so on, he leaves the gates open and makes it seem like, oh, like there's nothing to worry about. And so when the Takeda generals, like, uh, uh, Baba Nobufasa and uh, and so on, like show up. They're so confused and like, you know, surely this military genius that is Tokugawa Ieyasu, you know, he would have some, you know, if uh, there's something going on here, like there's he's there's some kind of ploy. And as has been as been pointed out on the Samurai Archives podcast, like this is straight out of Romance of the Three Kingdoms, which is a classic, uh, you know, historical fiction novel. Um, that was, you know, very well known at this point uh, in Japan. Um, uh, you know, a genius strategist you know, using an empty castle to confuse and, uh, you know, buy time against a superior force um, by making something look like a trick when there really is no trick. It's the appearance of a trick is itself a trick. Um, so, you know, did this actually happen in history? Probably not. Um, probably he just got away, and the story was later invented to make it up 
you know, turn this really decisive defeat into, uh, you know, a way of looking good, of saving face, as it were, uh, for Ieyasu. Um, so, you know, he escapes, he loses some good, you know, generals along the way, um, and then, <clears throat> you know, he's basically on the defensive until 1575, um, uh, you know, so between 1572, 1575, Takeda Shingen dies in 1573, not killed by a sniper's bullet at uh, Noda, uh, as is depicted in uh, fiction, um, especially the movie uh, Kajimusha by Akira Kurosawa. Uh, you know, Shingen gets ill probably and dies, and then the leadership of the clan uh, passes to his son Katsuyori. Um, and basically at this point, Ieyasu tells um, Oda Nobunaga, hey, look, unless you come and help me and fight off the Takeda and save my bacon, I'm going to join the Takeda and be in their vanguard when we march against you in Kyoto. And, you know, Nobunaga, you know, very receptive to this sort of, uh, I mean, this is very much Nobunaga's own style, um, you know, to talk in sort of harsh realities, um, you know, does in fact send forces and comes personally to uh, Nagashino, um, which is being attacked by uh, Takeda Katsuyori. And we know countless times, if you listen to the Samurai Aircraft podcast, uh, you know, there's the use of firearms to defeat the Takeda Cavalry, uh, the use of superior ground, uh, the use of, of palisades to really render the Takeda Cavalry, um, you know, to really rob them of their strength in this battle. And the Takeda are defeated, you know, decisively defeated. Really, it's really the downfall of the Takeda clan. Um, so, um, I'm going to leave it there. Um, as well, actually, I'll, I'll just talk about this briefly since I have a little bit of time. I'll end this around 45 minutes, so it's like three more minutes. So, uh, the next big event in 1579 is the death of uh, Ieyasu's wife, um, whose name I'm, I'm blanking on. Um, but she had been a daughter of Imagawa Yoshimoto, and she had been married to. Ieyasu to sort of cement the alliance or sort of the, the connection between the Matsudaira at the time and uh, the Imagawa clans. Uh, and you know, there's a bunch of stuff out there about how she was a super jealous lover and like irrational and totally like clingy and needy and stuff like that. Um, and she flew into a rage uh, when Ieyasu had an affair uh, with like a, a, a maiden, um, Lady Oman, um, which produced a son. Um, and the story goes that uh, uh, <clears throat> was eventually it, like it's it it made its well. I believe Lady Oman told Oda Nobunaga that uh, Imagawa Yoshimoto's daughter, the wife of Ieyasu, was plotting with Imagawa Yujizane or with the Takeda to kill uh, Oda Nobunaga, um, and therefore uh, Oda Nobunaga ordered Ieyasu to kill his wife, and um, at first imprison his son by that wife, and then order that son to commit suicide, that son being Nobuyasu, who was in fact married to uh, Nobunaga's daughter. Um, in fact, I believe it was her who actually orchestrated all of this. Um, so, and, and not uh, uh, Lady Orman. Um, the long story short, the upshot is that Oda Nobunaga orders Ieyasu to kill uh, his wife and son, his elder son. Um, and this other son uh, that was born by Lady Oman becomes his, act his new heir, uh, Hidetada. And you know, if you know anything, um, Hidetada is the one that actually succeeds um, Ieyasu as as the second shogun, if you will, of the Tokugawa um, shogunate dynasty, whatever. Um, and there is a second son in the mix. So Nobuyasu was the first son; he dies. Um, there's another son that no one really seems to like, 
um, who I believe is Hideyasu. And for whatever reason, I guess, I well, I think it's because Hideyasu felt guilty. I, I don't really believe this whole stuff about his first wife being jealous. I think he actually felt guilty about having cheated on her and created this second, this uh, uh, other child. Um, or having other child by other, by other mistresses, uh, even though it wasn't that uncommon. So maybe, you know, who knows what, what's actually true here. Um, but no one seems to like Hideyasu. He, like, Hideyasu kind of just disowns him and never acknowledges him. He's adopted into uh, the Hishiba clan, you know, Hideyoshi, uh, much later, um, to sort of cement that, that relationship between those two clans. Um, but interestingly, Hideyoshi never considers him Hideyasu as an heir himself, even though you know Hideyoshi has this, this famous problem with producing an heir. Uh, and you know, I guess you know logically, the the answer is like you know he doesn't want a son of Hideyasu to become uh, his heir um, because he you know Hideyasu is his long-standing threat um, for good reason uh, to the continuation of the Toyotomi clan. Um, but there's no evidence that Iyasu seemed to like him very much. Uh, and again, you know, he passes them over for his third son, uh, Hiratada. Uh, so anyway, that whole episode just kind of shows, you know, Iyasu once again, um, taking the, ru the route of what's politically expedient and sort of putting aside things like love or, you know, honoring your wife and son and, you know, literally killing his wife and son uh, to show his loyalty to his lord, uh, his senior partner, uh, Oda Nobunaga. So anyway, I'm going to leave it there for today. So that's 1579. Um, we'll pick up with the 1580s, Nobunaga's death, into the 1590s, the Korea invasion, and Hideyoshi, and so on, uh, in the next episode. And I will see you then. Um, I'm sure I'll have some corrections and stuff to make in the next episode as well. Uh, but until then, I hope you have a great day. Uh, comments, feedback, always appreciated either here or on the Samurai Archives forum. In the meantime, uh, keep it real. Bye.